welcome to the Pod of Inquiry, pushing the envelope for human understanding and optimization, the podcast for podiatrists. The Pod of Inquiry is designed to empower you with knowledge. What happens from there is up to you. Your host, Dr. Stephen Barrett, has designed this show to take you down some very deep rabbit holes, hopefully bringing you back out again, relatively unscathed, but cerebrally whipped, enabling a better understanding of all things worthy of inquiry. If you have more questions after the show, then that is good. The new discovery today many times was the new discovery 50 years ago, only to be suppressed or plainly ignored. Medicine and surgery can sometimes take a long while to get their paradigm shifted. We hope to have a lot of fun on this show and maybe destroy some ridiculous dogma along the journey. Thanks for joining the show today. Let's start spelunking. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Pod of Inquiry. Today, my guest is Dr. Andy Rader. Dr. Rader is going to discuss with me some of the developments that he's made in the treatment of Charcot neuroarthropathy and specifically his total midfoot replacement device. I think you'll find this episode very informative and maybe just give you a little bit different concept of how to think about reconstructive procedures for Charcot. If you'd like, uh, I interviewed Dr. Rader back in the first season. In those episodes, we took a pretty deep dive into the pathophysiology of Charcot neuroarthropathy. This episode, we discussed more the treatment side of it and his surgical technique that he's developed. So without any further introduction, please enjoy this fascinating conversation that I had with Dr. Andy Rader. All right, Dr. Andy Rader, thank you for uh, agreeing to come on again. It's always a pleasure for me to... Uh, hang out with you. Uh, I'd much rather do it with a, a bottle of great wine open between us, but uh, this will this will suffice because I'm very interested in uh, in this new implant that we're going to talk about today. And uh, so thanks for coming on. Oh, Steve, it's always great being with you. And, and uh, we can remedy the shortcomings of this meeting by getting together soon. That's absolutely right. So, right. so let's talk about Charco. Um, you yeah. had a, a tremendous uh, focus in this lately. Um, I would recommend if the audience is interested in what we're talking about today, which they should be, uh, that they can go back and hear what we did back in season one, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, which was really great. We'll get into some of the pathophysiology of Charcot again here, but if, if anybody's interested in more of a, maybe a deeper dive on that end, uh, I would recommend they go back to uh, season one, episode 24, episode 25. Uh, and you can find that on the podinquiry.com or any of the platforms that you so desire. So tell me about Charco. Where are we at well, today? Sure, Steve. Um, I guess if I were a listener, which I am on a weekly basis to the Pod of Inquiry, and, yeah. uh, and I got to tell you that you're always got the cutting edge stuff. I, I love it. And, um, but if I were a listener, I'd say, you know, Sharko, is it that big of a deal? Because I don't see that much of it. And when I talk with, fo with folks out there, you know, they'll say, oh, I don't know, you know, I'll see one of these every once in a, in a great once in a while, you know, maybe one or two a year. Uh, but you know, it's just not that big a, a deal in my practice. Mm -hmm. And, and when we look around to try to find, you know, What's published on the incidence and the prevalence rate of Charcot neuroarthropathy in the United States, where, where we're living and broadcasting from, um, there's really a dearth of information. Uh, there is there is some good literature out there, and there was a Danish study that I think a lot of us go back to, where for 23 years they looked at uh, in the in the records from their nationalized healthcare system, you know what was the what was Charco happening then in people with diabetes? You know what sort of incidence and prevalence, and they came up with rates uh, or a number, and that's a that's a pretty robust study. That's that's better than anything else that we have. So uh, that was from a, a guy named Svensson. Sounds like a Danish name, right? S-V-E-N-D-S-E-N, -E -E I believe is how, how he spelled it. Uh, but, um, but if we extrapolate that out to uh, 
the United States and understanding we have a different population. We don't have just a Caucasian population. We have got uh, a, a lot of groups that have higher incidence of diabetes and higher incidence of charco neuroarthropathy, like Native American uh, uh, or indigenous uh, American population, the um, uh, African American population, the uh, Latino American population. I mean, we have some groups that that really increase those numbers. But if we just look at that, assuming about uh, uh, 37 million people with diabetes in the United States, uh, the incidence, so the yearly number of new diagnoses of people with Charco should be about 27,600. And that would mean that the prevalence over the anybody living with Charcot at any given point should be about 208 or 209,000 people in wow. the United States. Okay. It's, it's mm -hmm. significant. You know, wow. if you compare that to, uh, and, and I'm stealing some of this information from a, a really cool article that Dane Wukic led, uh, Bob Freiper was, uh, was in on that too. Um, and they published that uh, in the last year or two, I would say. Um, but if we, if we compare that to some of the uh, uh, primary malignancies like breast cancer, uh, 47.7 thousand per year would be the incidence and prostate cancer, 40,000 a year. So Charco at 27 and a half thousand a year, that's up there. That's the third highest. Lung cancer is 20,000 or 21,000 a year. And then all the other ones, you know, kidney, thyroid, melanomas, soft, uh, soft tissue sarcomas, bone sarcomas, Hodgkin's lymphoma, all those are less than 6,500 a year. Okay. So when you think about Charco at 27,600 a year, this is a significant issue in the United States. If we just compare it to fractures in the United States, um, uh, hip fractures, about 42,000, ankle fractures, 35,000 in people with diabetes we're talking about. Uh, again, Charco at 27,600, pelvic fractures, 12,000, tibial shaft fractures, 10,000. It ranks up there. It's right. something that I think the listeners should pay attention to. So, yeah, because I think well, my, for this is a valid topic and it's good to spend your next hour thinking about it. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of points here that you have a, a real specialized practice. So these people are seeking you out from, uh, you know, a Charco perspective. So the average guy out of practice uh, may not have some of these indigenous populations or even a, a high diabetic po population, just depending on the demographics of where a, a per person is. But where you're at in practice affects your perception of how big the problem is. And if the problem isn't coming up to your doorstep every day, <clears throat> like they are to you in your practice, then you don't realize the numbers are, are so significant here. So I think- that's Big numbers. Yeah, yeah, that's a very big number. So circle so, back a little bit now yeah. on, if you can give, give the, the audience a couple of the bullet points that we talked about, about the pathophysiology of Charcot and, and that, I think it'd be great if you just spend a little time on that. Well, let's back up a little bit to uh, the middle 1960s. Uh, Harrison Brand, you know, they they said, okay, uh, there's this thing called Charcot mm -hmm. and warmth seems to be one of the earliest signs of breakdown. It, it gets warm. Right. And okay, that's interesting. Uh, in 66, Eichenholz, and we still use that classification today in large part, uh, he said, you know, there seems to be three stages. They, it looks like development, coalescence, and then uh, reconstruction or maybe residual deformity, however you want to call it. Johnson, a year later in 67, says, you know, there, there's associated fractures and dislocations as part of all this and this these changes, this this warmth and all uh, is associated with some ligamentous giving or laxity and subluxation. Uh, it's associated with impaired pain perception, apparently. And um, and so the year's 1967. Bobby Kennedy's still alive. 
Martin Luther King Jr. is still alive. We got a couple years to wait before Woodstock happens. And a lot of the knowledge that we have about Sharko, the, the huge majority of it, that knowledge bus has kind of gotten parked in 1967, and there hasn't been a ton since then. Some of the things that I guess maybe have shown up since then that it, with the advent of CT and MRI, as we've been able to confirm a lot of what uh, Johnson said is that, yeah, we absolutely, it's affecting the bones and the ligaments and the joints, and we see a fusion happening and, and, um, and so this guy named Shibata, um, he uh, introduced a stage zero Sharko later on uh, where, you know, you see all this happening. You can catch it on an MRI, but on plain film x-ray, you wouldn't see anything. Uh, but the MRI sees bone edema or, and bone bruising and these stress fractures with minimal cortical disruption at that point. Um, and so uh, with all that, and, and I should probably mention a guy named Petrova, too, who said, you know, the bone mineral density in Charcot really seems to be affected, which led people look to look at, uh, you know, what's going on with that bone mineral density? Do we have a disbalance of osteoblasts and osteoclasts? And, um, and what we can say absolutely is there's this profound local inflammatory response that happens. Okay. And and it's not a systemic response. Okay. So this local inflammatory response, one of the things that's been implicated in it, which I kind of I just I think I probably poo-pooed or glossed over a bit was rankle, R-A-N-K-L, mm -hmm. or right. uh that yeah, that that whole process. Um a rankle is is um receptor receptor ac activated of nuclear factor kappa beta ligand i believe is if i got that all right it's got it's gotten a lot of study since then and uh and it it's this rankle is an important mediator of of osteoclast osteoblast balance Okay, and and so just as a reminder, osteoclasts uh, are the uh, are the kind of the janitorial part of the of the bone, where they're getting rid of damaged bone bone fragments, bone debris, and osteoblasts are the construction crew, and they come back in and fill it back in, and that's part of our normal bone metabolism. That's a good thing. Um, so so how is that? expression of rankle increased in patients with charco well there's a supposition that the inflammation itself the warm foot induces rankle this pathway that okay. doesn't answer how did the foot get warm in the first place but so we're jumping in in the middle of the story i think with rankle but there's a i think there's research that supports a lack of negative feedback in patient with diabetes and different things can can be part of that. Um, the neuropathies, which you and I talk about extensively all the time, that can minimize the release of this neuropeptide called CGRP. And uh, boy, I'm calcitonin related peptide. There you go. I knew it had something to do with calcitonin. I'm glad you had the rest of it. <clears throat> so that CGRP, it antagonizes the expression of rankle. Uh, so CGRP should inhibit osteoclast motility, recruitment, and differentiation. So, so this is being minimized, this, this release of this neuropeptide. So with the lack of the CGRP then, osteoclasts get recruited by rankle in some sort of an unchecked fashion. And all of a sudden, you know, they're eating up damaged bone. They're eating up good bone. They're, they're really. They're, they're indiscriminate. Really making with a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Making a mess out of the whole deal. Another mechanism where rankle can be activated and thus osteoclast function is increased is in relation to the glycosylation end products that we talk about, uh, ages and advanced glycosylation end products. This, the formation of those ages is driven by hyperglycemia 
and it primarily affects collagen in tissues with the slowest turnover. So we talk about it with the, you know, the gastro soleus complex and the relative equinus they get, but we have to understand that's also there in, in cortical bone. And so that's an important part. Ages have been found to increase rank, rankle activation as well as induce an osteoblast or the, the construction crew death or apoptosis. Okay. So unrelenting inflammation absolutely is a hallmark of charco. That produces no per- production of rankle. Absolutely. That in combination with uh, glycosylation end products and um, and the and the neuropathy that goes with it, I think all of that probably plays a, a role. What we talked about last time was they were looking for a a genetic component, and so they were implicating this SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism for an a gene, an OPG gene. And, and they, they kept thinking that, okay, this is probably the key, you know, this gene, this rankle OPG gene expression ratio is all goofed up. But I think the Connors article in 2018 in JFAS really took a solid look at that and said, you know, it's not there. There's got to be some other alternative pathway for osteoclastogenesis that exists. And they suggested a broader genetic study was necessary. So the OPG rankle um, pathway is one that I, I just can't sign up behind. The rest of it, the German theory, the French theory for repetitive microtrauma and uh, autonomic dysfunction and what happened with that, um, I think we covered pretty well in, in your first broadcast and, uh, yeah, the short answer is no, those don't make any sense. If it was repetitive microtrauma, we should see a bunch of metatarsal fractures out at the neck and we don't right. see it, and all that kind of stuff. So, okay. So that's, I guess, as far as pathophysiology if you want to jump into anything more on that, that was well, probably already too deep. But well, no, it that, still begs that, the question: What do we do, right? Well, that 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 was what I was going to circle back to. Is so you have these different theories that were proffered, and you said that the the bus of information kind of got stopped back on its way to Woodstock, and uh, you know. So I guess there's a couple of questions there. What stopped the bus? Just, did people just become disinterested or they thought they had all the answers? And so, ah, we got the answers, no need for any further work. Is that fair? Right. And I think the work is, is being done, but I think uh, probably what happened and what Johnson was publishing back in the 60s, and it was reaffirmed by Mickey Pinzer later on, is that if you undertake any sort of uh, intervention for these people with these fractures, um, it's just fraught with all sorts of complication. And it became an area to avoid for practitioners. I mean, it was not a feel-good thing to treat at all. And so amputation became a mainstay and and conservative treatment. But... um, yeah, conservative treatment. You know, let's okay. Let's walk down a little bit of that path if you want to. Sure. Um, so in the acute phase, offloading with total contact cast to prevent deformity is gold standard. Really, I think what's being taught as the mainstay. Right. And if you weren't worried that that Charcot neuroarthropathy was a progressive disease that caused deformity, which led to ulceration, which led to infection, which led to amputation, which led to death, uh, then, um, uh, then yeah, you wouldn't do anything about it. Um, but you have to do something. So, uh, so some sort of, uh, uh, total contact cast is, is really what's, 
what's promoted. And that total contact cast uh, uh, generally, uh, my the the education I had was uh, you should do that for about 20 weeks and everything settles down and you're watching temperatures while you do that, but you're starting to look for some bony consolidation. And at that point where you're getting bony consolidation, somewhere around 20 weeks, you can think to move them into a really restrictive bracing like a Charcot restraint orthotic walking boot. Then keep them in that boot for a year or so. And if everything really stays stable and you have a plantar grade foot, then you know, success in that particular case would be to move them into a, a shoe with appropriate bracing and foot orthoses or AFOs or whatever it might be. And hopefully they can go on with life, albeit in a limited sort of way, because, right. you know, it's, it's not what it was before. And so, um, unfortunately, due to the progressive nature of the disease, ulcer development going that route the rates are still as high as 50% that are reported in the literature. So it's a 50-50 shot of if that's going to be okay. It is absolutely a role for conservative care, and in, and in no way am I uh, throwing that out. But in Charcot neuroarthropathy, even with displaced and unstable fractures, being managed with immobilization Nowhere else in the axial or appendicular skeleton are fractures and dislocations treated non-surgically. Does this sound almost like, you know, where else is a compression of a nerve treated with excision besides in the intermetatarsal space, you know, uh, for Morton's neuralgia? Right. Same type of thing. Where else in in the body, in that in that axial skeleton or the uh, or the, uh, the appendices, um, where else are fractures and fracture dislocations treated non surgically? It doesn't happen. So Mickey Pinzer again. We talked about him before, but in in '04 he wrote uh, you know that a review of all the current orthopedic literature uh, says that hey you know we really we see a universal agreement that active Charcot should be treated non-surgically with a total contact cast. Long-term care needs to be accommodation. And, um, and, uh, and there's, there's really not a, a surgical route that you should go unless you've failed everything else first. Mm -hmm. Once failed, once you've, you know, once you've let the entire building burn down to the ground, well then try to piece it back together again. Okay. So that's kind of how I'm seeing this is when you have Charco, you know, I think call the fire department, put out the fire right then and, you know, try to clean this thing up and rebuild it as opposed to watch it and let it burn clear down to the ground and then try to rebuild it from these burnt up sticks. So um, Mickey Pinzer looked at, uh, he had a, a group of about 150 patients with midfoot charco. At presentation, they had a plantar grade foot, everything was doing fine. And 59% of those ended up with a satisfactory result, meaning that they could get them into a shoe and a brace at some point. Okay. Afterwards. And then what happened to the other percentage? Near 41%. The percent. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't work out. Saltzman, uh, he published that uh, almost 50% had recurrent ulcerations going this route. But we saw those numbers as high as 50%. And then surgical um, intervention typically involved either an exostectomy, well, wound debridements, but an exostectomy of a bump that had formed right. that you couldn't get rid of. And again, you know, now you got this sagging foot and you're taking a bump off. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Typically, it's going to sag more, right? So eh, um, uh, deformity correction, yeah, there's a role for that. And uh, or else amputation and amputation still seems to be the standard of care in my neck of the woods. I had a patient come back here recently who was seen out of our community and was in the hospital and had Charcot with a midfoot ulceration. And they were told even after a said rate of eight and an ESR of a fraction, I don't remember what it was, 
uh, uh, negative bone biopsy that, hey, these take too long to heal. They never turn out well. You should just have your leg taken off. In this community, we don't believe in reconstruction. We believe in amputation. Hmm. And that's kind of the attitude still. Um, and you know what the mortality is with that once they... Sure we do. Yeah. Sure we do. Yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah. Other things that you might be able to do to intervene early, we, we looked at using the bisphosphonates. And, and I was a proponent of that. But there was a, a level one study done with those bisphosphonates where they gave a, a placebo and they found that uh, that even though it really did affect some of those markers of bone turnover uh, profoundly, the overall outcome, it didn't change. See, so, now that's, that, well, that's interesting because I have a very limited knowledge of, of bisphosphonates because I'm just not in that. But I came across an article, I don't know, five, six months ago, where yeah. they, they did demonstrate increased ossification, but they didn't show any increased structural um, integrity. I mean, it didn't like make the bone stronger, but it made it look better on x-ray. So in theory, I mean, you're shutting down these, these osteoclasts, which have been implicated as a big part of the problem, at least downstream. Right. They're a big part of the problem. You're shutting them down. It should, it should see better, but it, it really just, it hasn't panned out yet or else we're not looking at the right markers. I don't know. So, uh, so then you're left with, okay, you, you've done everything you can. You try to catch these folks as early as possible. If you've got a plantar grade foot, you got a beautiful foot and you cast them, half of them are going to go to, to poo anyway. Right. So I'm back to, and I think Dane Wukic makes this argument better than I could ever make it. And I would urge you to read his stuff. Anybody who's interested, uh, his most recent uh, article with uh, Bob Freiker, I, I just think it's a great article. But yeah, you know, you're left with nowhere else in the body. Do we just ignore this stuff and pat it on the shoulder and put it in a, a boot or a cast and say, good luck? Right, right. You know, what about fixing these things? And yes, it's wrought with complications because, well, it's not easy bone to fix, is it, Steve? No, kind of like nailing a custard pie to the wall. Yeah. So, you know, what uh, what do you do then? There's the big question. We've got external fixation. We've got internal fixation. A lot of stuff made specifically, you know, with Charco neuroarthropathy in mind. And um, and with and there's a nice review study looking at at, at different uh, I think 550 studies they looked at and they ended up with 40 some that actually met their criteria in a big systematic review of that external fixation, internal fixation, or a combination of the two, internal and external. And uh, they found that the mean time to weight bearing, regardless of technique, 17 weeks. Okay. All right. Four months, a little more? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a weight. Right. And uh, their complication rate in these studies was 36%, um, which just tells me there's some exceptional surgeons out there because if I count any complication I have in working with my Charcot population, I, I've i got to have surgically, I've got to have close to a 100% complication rate. There's going to be something happening, whether it's a little dehiscence or pin right. tract infections or something. But mm -hmm. either, that's what's reported in the literature. Be a wise reader Yeah, is what well, I'm trying to yeah. Well, yeah, so I was going to ask you that question. Uh, historically, what's traditionally been done, uh, aside from the ostrich where you bury the head in the sand and you just say, you know, go and, and be well in your calves or whatever it is that you can wear on this foot. Let's talk about, you know, the when they started impl impl implementing the uh, like x fix and, you know, some of the different beaming techniques for the, the midfoot collapse. What's that? What What's the historical success rate there? Because, right. Because there you're not doing anything to take the bad bone out. Right. So, um, so what you're doing is you are putting in 
uh, let's say for internal fixation, you're putting in some sort of metal and you're putting it into bone, which is like a marshmallow. And, and at some point, you're watching on x-ray CT and you're saying, okay, I, I think I've got enough bridging across these sites yeah, that um, I'm going to allow some weight bearing. And, and, and that's about 17 weeks later, according to these studies. When they start to allow the weight bearing, uh, then what they see is that the hardware routinely fails. There's, there's just, it's very difficult. And why does the hardware fail? Is there something inherently wrong with the hardware? No. It's the same hardware that we would use for a list Frank's fracture dislocation in somebody without a diagnosis of Charcot neuroarthropathy, and theirs doesn't fail. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's even a beefier version typically that we're using in Charcot. So, so I don't fault the hardware. I fault the, the type of osseous union that you're getting. And, and I think, again, Mickey Pinzer has been very honest saying that a huge majority of the patients, even if they show what looks like an osseous union on radiographic analysis that, uh, they're really kind of a fibro-osseous union. And so when I have gone in myself and taken out hardware that's broken on somebody on a, that, where the CT looks beautiful, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why the thing broke. I go in and I take it out because it's, you know, it's poking screws out and it's making a prominence and they're going to break down. Uh, once I take it out, if I go to flex my union sites, they do exactly that. They flex. Okay. It is not normal, healthy bone if you can get it to heal. So external fixation gave the same sort of results in my hand. And, and, and I've done hundreds of external fixation only type of uh, cases also. And I, I reach a point and I ambulate them much earlier. So I'm thinking that the physiologic stresses on the bone might produce stronger bone. And, and, I, and I'm still a huge fan of x -fix. Right. But once they come out of the X fix and down the road, even even if I'm following up with them with a, a crow for a while and and then slowly transitioning them into a total contact insole with a shoe, um, you know, that they still start to sag over time in their normal foot architecture until they end up with just kind of a, a flat looking foot. Most of the time it's good. I mean, it it still prevents ulceration, but it's not how I left it when I took the X fix off. Mm -hmm. so I think we just get really inferior healing. The problem with the studies, and we're I'm working right now on a study with uh, eight years out from a specific intervention that uh, we had been doing, but most of the studies are the, the typical things that we read. They're all within the first two years of surgery. So mm -hmm. we don't know a lot of the long-term results, right. unfortunately. And now a message from our sponsor. Well, folks, if you're over 40 and you're not using a supplement to augment nitric oxide production, you should really rethink that. This molecule is absolutely imperative to health, not to mention the cardio protection. Nitric oxide is a physiological molecule that does so many things for your health. I never miss a day of nitric oxide supplementation. That's how important it is. Long overdue, there is now a nitric oxide replenishment formula without the fear of oxalates. Approved Medical Solutions does not use beets, spinach, or arginine. Approved Medical Solutions is proud to offer our audience their oxalate-free nitric oxide formula. If you are not a healthcare provider, you can still get started by going to ApprovedMedicalSolutions.com and use the code SBARRETT at checkout and you will receive a 10% medical discount savings. For licensed practitioners, just go to ApprovedMedicalSolutions.com and register. They have unique bundles for all of the full-fledged spelunkers of the Pod of Inquiry. Use Pod of Inquiry at checkout after registration, and I am certain you will be pleased not only for yourself, but for all of your patients. Here's a little secret. If you order their testing strips and test every patient for a few clinic days, you will see that nearly every one of them will be deficient. 
When they see this result, they will want you to start them on it immediately. Now, thanks to Approved Medical Solutions, you can give them the best care without the worry of oxalates. Thanks for watching. You can start today. So if I could sum that all up, you're never going to get this diseased bone to heal properly, regardless of how many cool-looking screws and plates and all of this that we put on it. It's just... It's tissue that is past the point of return. It really seems to be. And we don't have a medical way of intervening right now to make better tissue. So that's that seems to be a huge limiting factor in long-term durability of surgical intervention. So for, now we're back in that camp of folks saying, well, even though it's fracture dislocation, you know, I'm not going to attack it because it, it just doesn't heal right. It's just not good tissue. And and I sympathize with folks who think that way. Um, yeah, I sympathize with them. I get it. It's still not the right answer, I don't think. Right. So, so some of the things that I've learned that, that might help with that and some of those key principles uh, is – is, is you you have to prepare the patient always. If you're going to undergo, even if you're not undergoing surgery, but especially surgery, you got to prepare the patient that even after surgery, you're never, you're never going to have a normal foot again. Mm-hmm. And if you can get them involved in some sort of a support group, I think that's tremendously important. The online support groups, they're all over the place. Uh, you know, everything online, social media, right? right. It's, all, it's all over the place. And, you know, if you only eat willow bark, uh, this will all go away on its own or, you know, whatever they say. Um, uh, So, so with a dose of caution, I I tell them about that. But when we're going to do something surgically, I let them know that we're going to lengthen that gastroc soleus complex. So we're going to decrease some of the deforming forces. What we're not talking about, which one of my uh, co-workers, Dr. Logan Orr, who who just joined our practice, brought up to me the other day is, what about weak anterior muscle, muscle groups? And should we, we be looking harder for weakness in EHL, EDL, TA, and, um, and that correlating with the neuropathy and maybe a superimposed compression of the common fibular nerve and Mm-hmm. You know, is, does that posterior group become relatively shortened because the anterior group's weak? So we need to look harder at that. Um, uh, so the other thing is we want to shorten the lever arm of the foot. If we don't want it to keep breaking down, well, then don't give them, don't try to give them back exactly what they had that led to the breakdown in the first place. Right. Shorten that lever arm of the foot. So we try to shorten the foot always. And in shortening the foot, you've decreased that lever arm. When you're going to hold them immobile afterwards, you have an increased risk of uh, DVT and PE. So absolutely anticoagulate these folks. And um, and then as soon as you can get them weight-bearing again, however you need to protect them, those physiologic forces are important and they're going to help a bit. I, I think those are some principles that we can apply regardless right yeah well let's get into the the implant that we touched upon a little over a year ago um and you made some pretty good headway it looks like into that um so why don't you just start off with i know you can't say some things because of fda issues and the fact that you're in a very early investigative part of this this process but Let's talk about the implant a little bit. Well, I'm excited about where this could go. So the implant adheres to some of these principles that we've already talked about. Uh, Shortening the foot. Um, What we found is that, um, that we can build into an implant a shortening of the foot. Okay. That was a complicated explanation. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. So, so, that, gonna... so I, that it fulfills that key. Right. Putting together bad bone to bad bone. I, I don't have a way of changing 
the metabolic and chemical pathology that's taking place. I don't have a way of, of making it good bone again. So until that happens, what about taking out the bad bone and replacing it with titanium? And that is what our implant's made of. So for midfoot charco neuroarthropathy, we remove the cuneiforms, the navicular, the cuboid, and um, and then prep with parallel cuts, the metatarsal bases and the head of the talus and the anterior uh, articular surface of the calcaneus. And we slide an implant that is shorter than what normal anatomy was in that space and just give up on those bones. And it's a type of implant where the where the uh, surfaces, both distally and proximally, allow for bony ingrowth. I mean, you don't need a lot, but right. But in that way, we're saying we're not we're no longer going to ask bad bone to heal to bad bone. We're just going to get rid of the bad bone and ask good bone to heal to an yeah. implant and hold it in place. Now, from a shortening standpoint, what are you shortening it with your implant? A couple centimeters. Centimeters. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we did all this research with, uh, and we looked at people. And so, for example, two people that we've put this implant in, one gentleman is six feet, seven inches and close to 400 pounds. Wow. Uh, the other is a lady who was five feet, two inches. And I don't remember her weight off the top of my head, but not heavy at all. And remarkably, their implants were virtually identical. So the midfoot doesn't change a lot from one person to the next. You've got roughly 38 centimeters, I'm sorry, sorry, 38 millimeters in one direction and 42 millimeters in another direction and a height of, you know, it, it's very consistent all the way across. So what we found is that across a whole spectrum of sizes of feet and people, uh, that um, essentially you probably could have one size implant and uh, that size implant, say, say you go out on a, you, you get crazy and you make two different sizes, small and large, they wouldn't vary very much. And so you'd put this implant in that mimics normal architecture. And now since you've removed everything in the middle of the foot, the front of the foot and the back of the foot they can be manipulated into any position you want. The implant determines the correct position. So you make the foot fit the implant. Okay. And that's done instead of making the implant fit the foot. In that way, everybody's foot turns out with the same architecture. They have restoration of the arch of the foot. Can you show that implant? You I can. Yeah, because I think the audit, and then in the show notes, we'll have the pictures as well of the implant. Here is, can you take pictures or should I? Well, I've got, I'll get some pictures uh, okay. um, and put them in the show notes, but that that's great. So this they, is essentially what the implant looks like. And so you've got a couple of places where you can attach uh, some of the tendon structures and they can start to grow back in so that you've got right. attachment there of mm -hmm. some key tendon structures but when you've got this the typical beaming or or a bolt that you're going to use what happens when you put that across bone that is inferior bone or is marshmallow Not bone, yeah no structure yeah. and it doesn't heal to normal healthy bone you get flexing constant flexing of that and that constant flexing causes fatigue in the metal and the metal breaks then. Mm -hmm. How would you deal with that if this were the floor of a of a room in your house and you were getting flexing in the floor? Well, you'd go to the basement and you'd put a support beam underneath so that it didn't flex so much. When you use this implant technology and you put that beam inside the implant, what it's doing is it's acting as a support wall for that implant getting rid of all the flexing that would normally occur with that. So in that way, we've created a very stable construct. The tolerances between the, the holes and the implant and the, the beams or bolts that you put in are very tight. 
it slides right through, but but there's not flex allowed inside there. I think the concept that people have to understand is that this, it's almost like necrotic, almost osteolytic or osteomyelitic bone. It's not going to get better. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's in a pathological state. And it's a little bit naive to think that it's ever going to regenerate once you change these forces around it, because it's just past the point of self uh, reparation. And so what you're doing, and, and in any other area, if you had a, a tumor in a long bone or you had a, uh, you know, some type of infectious process or something like that, you would never expect that bone that is affected to be able to regenerate to a point where it would have normal integrity and normal structural responses. So why is that, why is it such a hard conundrum for people to get over um, with this in the Charcot perspective? Well, I, I think um, they don't care to think about it at all anyway. So the the few of us that are do around the United States who are doing Charcot reconstruction, um, you know, you know, we're still operating with the basic principles of, of AO and mm -hmm. uh, or what was taught by Ilazarov uh, with uh, external fixation. And that is, um, you know, you you place everything back together as best you can, and then the body takes off and, and we'll do the right job there. But uh, in speaking with the surgeons, and we had them back uh, to the United States here locally for a, uh, a master's symposium on Charcot neuroarthropathy, and the, uh, the surgeons from the Ilazarov Institute that came over, they said their techniques they just, they can't recommend it. They can't dissuade us. They said Charcot's such a different beast altogether that all the principles don't apply. You can't expect the same results. Same thing in AO standard AO technique, the principles don't apply when the bone metabolism is completely different. We know that if, if people are smokers or they're on NSAIDs or they have uncontrolled diabetes, that non-union rates skyrocket, mm -hmm. even in the absence of charcoal. You've got an ankle fracture and it's wow. a smoker who's on an NSAID and who's got an A1C of 9.6. Their odds for non-union is going to go way up. Their, their metabolism, their bone metabolism is affected by that. Charcot adds yet another layer of complication on top of it. And people who undergo this type of work... Um, they're trying to adhere by these basic principles that we were taught, but it's time for us until we can change the bone metabolism. It's time for us to rethink those basic principles because this is a unique outlying situation. Therefore, so, so by getting the, rid of that bone might be the option. Okay, right. So by the misunderstanding of maybe what's really going on and maybe a misunderstanding of the Elizabeth uh, concepts and the AO concepts. People are just kind of stuck in this rut of this is the way we do it. We're going to make it look better on x-ray. We're going to give this patient an arch and, you know, a, a foot that's not going to ulcerate. But you're expecting this this bad clay to mold into good clay, and it never works. Right. Yeah. And if we had more literature that indicated uh, this this just this isn't going to give you what you want. Right. It takes we know seventeen to twenty three years for that literature to actually translate into clinical practice. Yeah. That's how slow we are. Right. Um, if we have the literature that says, hey, you do you know, go ahead and replace it with titanium and you're going to get good results, right. still going to be 17 to 23 years before we start to implement that. It's just we oh, don't have the literature yet. Right. Well, it's a, it's a big hurdle to get any new concept, regardless of how much merit and validity it has to um, permeate the already tainted mind. Right. It's, you know, Absolutely. and in some cases, I think it was uh, Max Planck that talked about integration of, of new scientific findings, discoveries that 
really you almost have to wait for the, the, the group that is, is poo-pooing it, that's throwing all of the, the rocks at you to die because they're not ever going to be convinced. It's just, you know, you hope to catch the young folks as they're coming on up. So we'll start. Well, a they, bit. they seem to have a vested interest in not being made to look foolish. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, just like when my, my new partner, uh, Logan Orr, brought up uh, weak anterior muscle group. My first response was to try to think of, well, you know, not to listen to it, but how am I going to respond to that to convince him that he's he's too early in practice to come up with a good idea like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why Fortunately, he came up, he came I've up been with a good to enough, Yeah, I've been to enough counseling type of things to know that, hey, I need to listen, to truly <laughs> listen and not think of my response first. And when I listen to him, I realize he's got a thought. Yeah. And you know, maybe that these fresh minds haven't been painted, painted so much right. That, right. That, that things can soak into their sponge where, you know, the old crusty guys like me and everybody that are all have our own confirmation of biases and all this other stuff. It's a little harder to, um, you know, but I've always been one to, if you can show me a better way to do it, I'm a, and, it, and it's valid, I'm going to adopt that right away. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's never really been a big ego thing for me. Uh, I just You're an outlier, to, brother. <laughs> well, uh, I'd rather be an outlier than not lying, right? Right. Yeah. So what about your clinical experience with the implant now? Because yeah. when we talked a year plus ago, um, I don't know that you had really made, might, might put in one or two at that time. Uh, I, d I don't remember. We started doing it in 2020, which was an awkward time to even start right. that process uh, for reasons I'm sure everyone who's listening to the podcast can understand. But when we did gain access to the hospital again, uh, we started to implant these in a select group of patients. And in all fairness, we picked the worst. So uh, those folks with terrible rocker bottom deformities, uh, calcaneus sitting lateral to the fibula, talus still in the ankle mortis. I, I mean, these were, these were truly disasters. And, um, and we have IRB approval for this. We have approval through the FDA uh, to implant these. Um, we, we did not have an easy pathway toward to getting the FDA to approve it because there is no what's called a predicate device in order to get easier approval for things that you're going to implant into human beings. If there's a predicate device, you can say, hey, it's just like theirs. Now, we've shaped it a little bit different, but it, it carries no more risk than than right. this other device, this predicate device. Well, in our case, there was not a predicate device. And so we had to go through this unique pathway, patent pathway and, and FDA approval pathway where they allowed us a certain number of, of applications. And, um, and so we were using those up. And with the IRB, I, I can report on a dozen of those anyway. Um, uh, they go in very well. So in the surgery itself, and I will send a link for a kind of a cartoon video, not super accurate, but gives the general idea mm -hmm. uh, for how it goes in. Um, what you do is you make a, a medial incision after you've lengthened your, you lengthened your uh, gastroc soleus, uh, however you need to do, and, and realign the rear foot. Um, but uh, you make a medial incision and you just take out the bad bone. Once you take out the bad bone, uh, parallel cuts at the metatarsal bases and then at the uh, articular surface of the talus, the talar head and the anterior surface of the calcaneus are made. And you've got a great big open space inside there now. That open space, this implant fits in with a good centimeter of of room on either side, if not more, because again, there's nothing holding it. You know, you can twist the forefoot upside down compared to the rear foot if you chose to do that. I mean, it, you can put it in any position you want. So you feed a wire in then through that surgical incision down the first metatarsal. And uh, as it hits the head of the first metatarsal down the shaft into the head, then you 
you uh, push it almost like you, if you're doing a retrograde um, pinning for a hammer toe. Uh, you push it through the first metatarsal head, make your little cut, and uh, then you know that your beam is going to go directly up the first metatarsal shaft because you've already seen where it comes out. Right. You put it in by hand. So you pull it out and uh, you do the same thing with the fourth. You slide the implant in and put it in the two holes in the implant. And then uh, then you advance the wire proximally in both of those sites until you can see it come out. And you put it dead in the middle of the remaining tailor head and in the middle of the articular or the former articular surface of the calcaneus. And so, you know, you can just with your eyes, you see positions perfect at that point. Because okay. you still got room, you can right. you know, peek around it. You got to, you know, right. it's short at two centimeters. And then uh, you advance the beams, and because of that, it's a very quick procedure. Hmm. That quick procedure, what we noticed, and I, I put out there on LinkedIn here recently, uh, and I hadn't really been paying attention, but I saw the timestamp on our our post op uh, films. And I saw that uh, the timestamp was right at two hours after we started the procedure. And for a Charcot reconstruction, and I think I work pretty fast, but that's way faster than I can do any other type of AO technique or X-fix technique with a, a re complete rebuilding of the foot. Mm -hmm. So the surgical time really shortened. And as a result of that, I think we saw a lot less complications with wound healing afterwards. That was one of the first big exciting things, even in this disaster population. The other thing that we saw is, um, is that uh, um, you, would, you would start to see some bony ingrowth because now you've cut back to good bone on either side. Mm -hmm. And you're starting to see some bony ingrowth into the implant relatively quickly on CT scans. And that gave me that encouragement to start them weight bearing much earlier. So instead of 17 weeks, we were starting to see, if we started to see that bony and growth starting at six weeks, we would start transitioning them into weight bearing between six and eight weeks afterwards. I think those physiologic stresses of weight bearing also helped with the bone healing. Right. And um, and I and I saw that as a big difference. The the last thing I saw is that these folks, they've got an arch that looks well exactly like mine afterwards because the implant's designed after my Are foot, you? my arch. Yeah, right. I think I got a pretty good <laughs> foot, you know. Yeah, uh, I like. I'm it. not wearing socks on the beach. I'm 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 go. showing it off. I got there a good go. foot. It's yeah. beach ready. Right. Yeah. So, so, um, so they all ended up with a foot that they really just look like mine. So then are you doing anything to maybe foster some of the bone regeneration, like some of the regenerative things, or are you having to stay clear of that because of the investigational nature of where you're at right now? We, uh, did on two, I believe, uh, but, uh, that was really, uh, restricted a lot by the hospitals and the insurances. Mm -hmm. These are not the best insured patients. Right. No, I understand. Right. But so my, my, I believe it was only on two that I was able to use a, a DBM maybe mixed with a, a bone marrow aspirate. Uh, okay. And, and that was, that was the extent of what I was allowed to use. Interesting. That may be something that in the future would be a, a thing to a consideration to look at. Um, oh, anything be, you can do to yeah, help, I think, to, would be a wise choice. Absolutely. But um, but these we were just trying to see uh, for the FDA. Did they stay in? Did they have complications with that much metal being in their body? Were there, you know, infection right. problems? You know, just was there any problem having this? Right hunk of titanium in there. We didn't have to show anything about bone ingrowth, but we did see it. Uh, but all that work's been previously done and published. Um, it's just that big of a piece of metal was a concern for the FDA. What about, what about, I know it's a very limited amount of patients, 12 patients that we're talking about, but what about uh, post-operative infection? I mean, these folks are highly susceptible to infection compared to somebody who's not metabolically challenged like that. And because we had a uh, soft tissue envelope that was so nice, you know, I'm not having to try to close it around big, thick plates or anything like that, or right. having uh, uh, through wires that 
you know, constantly provided a route for uh, bacteria and uh, fungi to, to get into the body. Uh, because we were able to zip it up when we were done and didn't have any sort of a competition for soft the soft tissue envelope, what we saw is that they, they heal remarkably well. Remarkably. Mm-hmm. So and that, we that, weren't seeing soft tissue infections. Obviously, I'm not going to do this in somebody with an open wound. That's still right. reserved for external fixation or get the wound closed first. Right. Um, and we were uh, sure ahead of time uh, that they had no osteomyelitis too. So uh, we did pick those parameters before we were going to put an implant in. But the deformity was just, so, just unbelievable. Yeah. Now your your soft tissue envelope that you're able to preserve. How hard is that to maintain? Because I would imagine I haven't seen one of these. I'd love to come up and watch you do one sometime. But um, the the fact that you say it takes you two hours, I can tell the audience that Dr. Ray is one of the most skilled surgeons that I've ever seen. And uh, so your two hours might be somebody else's three or four. But let's go back to this this surgical em- or this soft tissue envelope. Are you uh, basically just separating the periosteum from the these bones, dead bones that you're resecting? Or, what, I mean, because there's not a lot of soft tissue on the dorsum of the foot. There is not. And so, uh, you know, what, what I do is through that medial incision, I'm just making sure I'm not disrupting the vascular supply. And ideally, you know, this is done with no tourniquet. Right. Uh, it also does, you know, much better in, for healing in general. And if you want to see some uh, good information on that, uh, look up a guy named Adam Perler uh, down in Florida. He he has a lot to say about not using tourniquets. So, um, so uh, it, with that, uh, you you quickly run into bone, but the bone doesn't it doesn't look like familiar bone, right? It's it's right. a mess, right? And, um, and so you, it's not, again, for the faint of heart. You have to be aware of where you are. Uh, so a, a subperiosteal dissection uh, dorsally and plantarly is attempted, although um, so many times there's already fragments of bone all throughout the soft tissue that uh, that's not necessarily possible. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, with residents in the room, I'd make a, a dorsal incision and we'd find the deep fibular nerve, the dorsalis pedis artery and the venae comitans that went with it and elevate them at the level of the dorsal foot near the uh, cuneiforms. Uh, and th- those are going to run just deep to the extensor lucis brevis tendon. So that can be sacrificed when you're right. finding it. Right. Um, but uh, if you section that bone, so as you encounter bone as you're heading across and you know where the metatarsals are uh, distally, and so you're just working proximally, if you section that into quarters, then you can take that bone out pretty easily carefully dissecting around those fragments. Right. And, uh, and, and so the dissection is probably half of the procedure. It's a good, it's a long part of the procedure, but you want to head across there being cautious about those things. Right. Um, if this were in a normal healthy foot, I'd say do subperiosteal dissection, put a ribbon retractor in for medial lateral, you know, right. whole lateral, and uh, you'd be protecting it that way. But it, it's not quite that simple with the with the messy charco foot. Right, right. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's one just piece kneeling it out. Right, it's one thing to look at stuff on a cocktail napkin, but right. then when, when you get intraoperatively with these things, uh, so what do you do with the deep plantar artery? You have to uh, ligate it. No, no. Um, so are you keeping it intact? Are you talking the intermediate of the communicating branch? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so between, that's that's between typically that's that's supposed to be between the first and second metatarsal bases. Right. So it's and, distal uh, to where you are. It's distal to where I am. So all yeah. I'm doing once I've made that cut, then I'm going to bring all the metatarsals together, the metatarsal bases together. If it's been a divergent sort of a, a, a dislocation uh, throughout the mid tarsus, then you have to bring the first over to the second, and we've created this cool device here uh we called it the mat okay mid tarsal alignment something tool okay well i had a good name but anyway 
but we throw wires through this thing. You can see there's little slots on it and holes. Mm -hmm. Throw wires, and then we draw the metatarsals together. Once they're drawn together uh, with a slot in it, then you just run your blade uh, down that slot. Uh, there's a specific blade that uh, that we that's used for ankles and knees that just runs right down that slot, takes off the metatarsal bases, and in one cut, that's prepared. Fantastic. But your, your vasculature is all protected at that point. Well, that's a wonderful explanation, and we'll put in the show notes some more of these, uh, the, the uh, little animation that you have, as well as some more of the, uh, the photos. Sure. Um, now, one of the things that I'm going to get some emails about is, hey, when can he train me to do this? So <laughs> uh, let's answer right. that question before I have to answer those emails. So um, uh, anybody is welcome to uh, contact me through any of the various social media platforms. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to talk with you about this. But before this is going to be a 510K device, we we can't build off of any other device as a predicate device. So we're going to have to develop all of our own safety and uh, efficacy literature. Uh, that will probably be done through the government. And um, that those processes, those those talks are underway uh, in in the government then once we have enough literature to support the FDA approval so that it can be used in, in the private setting, um, then we should have 510K devices where they'll all look the same. Right now in the private setting, it uh, can be made available, but they have to be custom devices. Okay. And if they're custom devices, uh, then we work with the surgeon uh, to obtain the CT in one millimeter cuts with uh, 3D reconstruction. We create the device custom for that patient, even if all the custom devices really look very similar. Uh, we create that for the uh, the doc and then, um, uh, then side by side, uh, I will go with the doc and, and walk them through the procedure then. Very good. Very good. Andy, thank you so much. Uh, I admire what you do and uh, always find you tremendously in intellectually energizing. So uh, really it's appreciate fun stuff it. to think about, isn't it? Oh, man. I mean, it's what it's all about, really. Yeah. You know, so. And we still we didn't we didn't really create too much controversy today. We didn't discuss some of the dogma that I'd like to spit on and and stomp out. Um, maybe in another year, you'll invite me back again and, and we'll just do controversial topics. I would love to do that because there's nothing better than being a destroyer of dogma. And right on. that's, uh, and it won't be a year. Now that you open that up, I believe there'll be an invitation coming soon. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. Thanks so much. Great. Before we continue with this great discussion, I just want to take a quick break to acknowledge this week's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Savant Sellers, providers of boutique tier one reds at a tier two price point. Let's imagine you are spelunking in a cave out in Napa Valley and you come across some of the juice from Savant Sellers. You may just never want to come out until it's gone. Savant Sellers sources all of their fruit from the really big name boutique vineyards. That's right, where the elites get their fruit. If we put a vineyard designation on our bottles, we would be contractually forced to sell our wines at three to four times our current pricing. Yes, full disclosure, I am one of the three principals and I'm very proud of our wines. Savant Cellars is the genius of wine. Simply great wines, vintage after vintage, crafted in a Bordeaux style so you can lay them down for years or drink them now. They simply just get better. Use the code SPELUNK15 to get a 15% discount at SavantSellers.com. That is C-E-V-A-N-T Sellers.com. SPELUNK15. We hope you all enjoyed today's show and got some truly empowering knowledge out of it. You can always follow up on anything we talked about in the show notes, found at our website, potofinquiry.com. 
If this incredible and educational conversation has tickled just a little bit of your cortex, please leave us a review and spread the message to your friends and colleagues. Let's keep spelunking. This podcast is designed for informational purposes only. It does not constitute any medical or surgical consulting advice or imply a development of any physician-patient relationship. The opinions of guests who are featured on the show are not necessarily the opinions of Dr. Barrett or the production team. This podcast is owned solely by Barrett Medical and Surgical Media, LLC. While the show is highly oriented for physicians and healthcare providers, anyone interested in the improvement of human performance and understanding will find us a welcome goblet to sip from or guzzle. However, no representation or warranties are made in any way whatsoever on this podcast for any products, techniques, or other things discussed. Invited guests are not vetted by the pot of inquiry for their qualifications and may have a direct or indirect financial interest in what they present and discuss on the show. The pot of inquiry disclaims any responsibility from anything taken from the show and used personally or professionally. It is a responsibility of the listener to perform their own due diligence prior to the implementation of any ideas, products, techniques, or anything talked about on the show.